Aloha, my name is Julie Mitchell and I'm the executive director at Kuikahi Mediation Center. Kuikahi is a nonprofit community mediation center serving East Hawaii. We were founded in 1983 as a program of the Island of Hawaii YMCA and in 2006, we became our own independent nonprofit organization. We, our mission is to empower people to come together, to talk and to listen, to explore options and to find their own best solutions. To achieve this mission, we offer mediation, facilitation and training like this one to strengthen the ability of diverse individuals and groups to resolve interpersonal conflicts and community issues. Our brown bag lunch talk is held every third Thursday at 12 noon on Zoom. You do need to register online at Eventbrite each time to re receive the Zoom link. We do have some other exciting events coming up uh, next month. We will have uh, Jelani Madaraka from HUD will be talking uh, as our brown bag speaker. And I don't have the title of that off the top of my head. I will get it for you by the end. And then we all have, and then we also have two trainings that are being offered by Peter Adler on June 4th and June 18th. And people can sign up for one or both of those. Uh, one is called the Fact Intensive Controversy and the other is called the Multi-Party Policy problem. That is hard to say without bumbling it. So if you are interested in either one of those, you can um, you can check them out on our website. I did put an introductory note in the chat. I'll put it there again, and it does have our website in there. Okay. Um, at the end of our talk, we are going to ask you to fill out a short online survey, which helps us with our grant funding for this free series. So please take that before you leave. And I will send it out an email later with the slides and a video link to this video. And if you're not sure that we have your email, like if you are Zooming uh, with a friend or you are using their link, uh, you can send me a private chat with your name and email address so that you make sure that you will be getting that. So uh, if you like this talk, please feel free to register for more in the future. And Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Sylvia Kahalia Dolena. She holds an MBA and an MS. She worked for Hewlett Packard for 19 years, including as the Global Programs and Operations Manager. She has worked as an external business consultant with HB and other high-tech and retail companies like Best Buy and AMD. Most recently, Sylvia helped facilitate Hawaii Rainbow Rangers to acquire the Hawaii County Animal Control Services contract, and she delivers leadership development programs throughout Hawaii and beyond. So without further ado, uh, it's all yours, Sylvia, and is this a good time for me to pull up the, slide, the share screen slides? Yes, thank you. Thank you and welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be here and talk about my very favorite topic, change, because change is all around us. We can't get away from it. And when people encounter change, even if it's a positive change, our innate sense of survival freaks out a lot of times. You know, we get into a fight, flight, free, flee. Any range of emotion will happen to us when we encounter change, because we always sense, what is that change going to do to me and for me? So I want to really talk about change. And in our first slide, I put the question there, how can you win if you don't even know the game you're playing? So if you are passionate about making a change, whether it's in your life, in your business, in your relationship, or for a very important cause, then there's six strategies that I'd love to share with you. Now, in the materials that Julie will send you out, there's a lot more than we can cover today in one hour because this is really a two-day workshop. So we may skip some of the slides, but I'm going to hit the very most important slides so that we can have a discussion about it. We can, uh, I can relay the information to you. Success is a choice and a game to master. And there's an inner game in how we deal with it. And there's an outer game in what our behaviors are, activities, and strategies. 
So if we understand the game and know how to win at that game, then we can change the game. And eventually we can create our whole new game. Okay, next slide, please. And this is, has to do with what I was already saying. Successes and failures in life can be traced to how well or how badly we adapt to those inevitable changes that confront us in life. And it seems like it's happening more frequently these days. Next slide. Next. In order to play the game and in order to be really, really good at making changes, positive changes, we have to master certain internal qualities. And in those internal qualities, it has to do with internal fortitude. It has to do with presence, being in the moment, emotional discipline. And what I call circular vision is being aware of everything all around you. Strategic thinking, how do you apply a strategy, self-knowledge, and then the power of observation. The power of observation is really key because in the power of observation, you will be able to know and understand just through being observant. And that's going to be really important. And building mastery in the outer game, it will allow you to respond, to transform situations that seemingly are not positive situations into an opportunity. You'll be able to strategically maneuver through different situations. You'll be able to show up powerfully and confident and position yourself as a game master. Change agents in this day and age are very highly prized in many companies and corporations because as the economy moves faster, as situations move faster, people need to come up with those, keep up with those changes. And it's very difficult when you have big businesses, mega corporations, how do you make that happen? So I'm going to talk about this in the sense of business, and I'm going to use the analogy of a chess game, and it can be any game that you love to play and just know that it's a game because when we look at it and we look at it as a game, we can be more objective about it. Okay, next slide. So I've covered some of this saying that we're going to use the analogy of a game and in every game, there are rules to the game, players in the game and an objective of the game. So you really need to understand all of that. And no matter what situation or organization that you want to change or advance in, it can be your community association, it can be your cause, it can be any, any of those things. It is all really set up as a game for there to be winners and losers. And understanding it as a game will help you change it. And then once you've changed the game, guess what? You can play the game on your own terms or you can create a new game. And we always say, change the game, don't let the game change you. Next slide. So the definition that I'm going to use here of game changer is a newly introduced element or factor that changes an existing situation or activity in a significant way. And you are that element. In anything that you want to change, you are that in newly introduced element to that game. Next. So. Is everybody ready? We'll get right into it. We have a lot to cover. I will give you as much as I can in the time that we have and allowing a little bit of uh, question and answer time. Okay, next. Now, I just want to go through these briefly. These are the six strategies. Uh, the first one is naming the game and understanding the game that you're in and understand the objective of the game. So what is this game supposed to do? And also you need to understand the rules of the game, the spoken rules and the unspoken rules. And number two, claim your game outcome. You really know why you're in this, why you want this change, what you want from it, what your commitment is to this winning this, this game. So you need to claim your outcome and be very clear with yourself. And number three, name the players, know who your opponents are, know who your team is, in the game with you and know what each player wants from the game 
this is going to be a really good exercise in um, human observation, people observation, people watching, because you really need to know and understand who you're in the game with. Strategy number four, win the game. Learn how to build mastery and win the game. Then once you've won the game, we go into strategy number five, change the game. You can make subtle changes, you can make big changes, but you want to make changes based upon understanding what that game is, and you want to also improve it. And number six, create a new game. Create a huge paradigm shift, a huge transformation for this game that you're so passionate about, this cause that you're passionate about, the situation that you're very passionate about. You can change it. You can shift the paradigm to a larger broader perspective. Next. Okay, so we're just going to go a little bit deeper in each one of these. And like I said, we're not going to cover each and every slide because there's a lot there. So number one is name the game. So understand the game that you're in. And here are some uh, questions to help you do that. Next slide. So you want to ask, what is the game that you're playing? You want to define it. You want to give it a name. And what is the evidence that you have through observation, through facts, whatever, that this is really the game? So you want to list those. And what are the rules of the game? The spoken and unspoken rules. And you want to identify them. So let's just look at this a little bit with an example. I'm going to use the same situation all the way through. And the example that I'm going to use is the example of my commitment to ensuring women have equal pay for equal, an equal job done. And when I was working in high tech, the, the game there that we played, it was called performance evaluation for merit raises or merit increases. That was what they called the game. But in further analysis and looking at the game, it was really a subjective evaluation to do salary administration by ranking people. And ranking meaning who's the top person, the most productive person, all the way down to who's the least. Yes, we got into a room. <laughs> all the managers got into a room and started talking about their employees to get them ranked on a scale. When we did that, when we did that, there was lots of things that I suddenly became aware of. So I walked in thinking this was a performance evaluation for merit raises. And I said, no, this is not that. This is very subjective. There don't seem to, there aren't any rules to this that I could determine at the time. So I really had to watch what people were doing and what were, they were saying. One of the underlying biases here was that this is an engineering company and men were viewed to be more technical than women. So women typically were down at the bottom of the scale of ranking, so they got less pay. So that was the real game. Next. So when I saw that, <laughs> I had this moment that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. Nothing is as it seems. And what I thought was real was not. I really thought going into it, it was true for performance evaluation, salary, you know, merit races. So what I believed in was not, was false. It was total illusion. And what I counted on, I had counted on it being a fair process. And that went away. Because I realized it was a different game, and I didn't even know it. Okay, next slide. Now, the objective of the game. Know the objective of the game. Why does this game exist? Well, in this case, it existed because they wanted to administer salary in a way that they believed was fair to the top performers. And what is this game intending to accomplish? It was intending to accomplish that same thing, to, to distribute 
a finite bucket of money to top performers. And the game was set up to accomplish the goal, so they thought, but since it was a very subjective system, the game really didn't accomplish the goal of rewarding top performers. Now, why are you playing the game? Why am I playing the game? I have a very strong sense of being a woman, um, a strong sense of fairness and equality and wanting to see, see that happen in whatever situation. And because women are we're down at the bottom of the scale and not making as, as much money doing the same job that the men were, I wanted to see if I could change it. And it was very important for me to play this game because I wanted to see if it could be changed. I didn't think it was fair or just to any of those women, including me. And I wanted to see, I had a very strong motivation to change it because I was passionate about it, not just for myself, but for everyone else. And what I intended to accomplish when I play the game, I intended to win the game, change the game and make it equal pay for every person in the company based upon performance and not gender. Next. Okay, so um, Julie, we said we would take a few questions in, in that first section. We're not going to take questions all the way through, but this first section is really a lot to understanding. So if you have a question, we'll take one or two right now. Either, if you could please either raise your hand or put it in the chat, that would be helpful. Okay, let me see. Okay, here's a question. Um, are most games left brain competitive games? Because I don't hear people speaking about cooperation in games in the same sentence. Uh, in my experience, most games are very much left brain and they're very competitive. And e even in team sports, even in team sports, uh, there has to be um, you know, some collaboration, some team effort. However, you'll always see st stars out of those games appear as individuals. So just the sense of it being a game, as I said before, it's always set up for winners and losers. So that, ma that makes it very competitive and very left-brained. If there's any other questions at a time, please either use the raise hand feature or put it in the chat. Okay, so the, the second strategy is claim your outcome. You need to be really, really clear with yourself. And you really need to understand without a doubt what you want from the game because many times it will be very challenging. You'll ask yourself, why am I doing this again? You want to have that sense of purpose, that sense of clarity for yourself that will get you up in the morning and say, okay, I'm ready for this game again today. Okay, next slide. So going a little bit deeper in that, you, you wanna ask yourself a lot of questions because it's going to take time and energy and effort. And when we look at this game, we don't wanna go into a game and change a game that's working well. So you want to examine what is it about this game that's unfair or what is it about this game that needs to change and why does it matter to me? What's motivating me? Why do I care? And then you have to make a commitment to making a change and to sticking to the game, sticking it through because there's nothing worse than going into it with a lot of exuberance and then having something stall you or stop you. It's very demoralizing. So you want to be clear with yourself and know why you're doing it because that will carry you through. You also want to know what you are setting up as your success factor. How will you know that you've achieved what you said you were going to achieve? What is your measure of success? It doesn't have to mean anything to anyone else. It just has to mean something to you. Okay, next slide. All right, number three, this is my favorite one. <laughs> it's know the players in the game with you because as a coach, I really love to work with people and meet with people and understand people. And I always, I always say, 
if I can understand a person and understand their operating nature, then I know that they will be true to that operating nature and I will be able to understand their behaviors, their statements, their motivations and all of that. So in this game, you really need to know the players that are in with you and that includes you too. Okay, next slide. This is about knowing yourself. And it's, it goes a little bit deeper than being clear with yourself. It's knowing yourself at an internal level. You need to be able to know yourself so much that when you're playing this game, you have no inner conflict. You are doing it for a true cause and a true purpose. And that keeps you in integrity with yourself. Okay, next slide. Now, knowing the players in the game with you, yeah, if, if you're new to this game, it's going to be um, a little bit challenging and it's going to take you a little bit of time. But if you have questions in your head when you meet people and talk to people, you can start your observation of them. You can determine or evaluate their strengths that will help them win the game or what their limitations are in knowledge or any other area that's important to this game. And you can use those strengths or limitations to help your cause. If someone has a strength in this area that's going to benefit your cause, then you want to be able to team up with them and work with them. But also on the other side is you need to know their fears and their aspirations. So everyone has purposes and concerns. Purposes are what they care about and concerns are what they worry about. Everyone has fears for whatever reason. And some of the fears in games that are especially competitive and games where you're using um, or determining people's livelihood, yes, there could be a fear factor in there. So how can you address or mitigate their fears? And it all is in understanding where that fear comes from. And with that understanding, people then are more motivated to work with you. You don't have to agree with them, but if you understand them, then you can help mitigate those fears. You can address those fears. You can put things in place to alleviate those fears. And you can build from that aspirations and motivation with them so that they can help you with the cause. Because as you understand them better, they will be motivated to understand you better. Now, in, in continuing the, um, the example that I was using in the ranking situation and uh, merit pay and, and evaluation, knowing the different players was really, really important because in just preparing for this, they called it the ranking, uh, preparing for this ranking, I was talking to different people, to different uh, uh, you know, my peers and they were saying, oh yeah, you need to watch out for Blair because when he goes in, he expects to win all of the top spots. I go, what? <laughs> yeah, he expects to, his engineers to have all the top spots because if his engineers get the top spots, then he, he'll be viewed as a really good leader. And then his ranking as a manager will go up. I go, oh, okay. All right. So knowing that about Blair, how would I address that in a situation with him, you know? Also, there were some managers that were going to be in the ranking session with their engineers that were fairly new. There were some that were highly experienced in this game and they knew the way to phrase things. They, the way, they knew how to describe their engineers so their engineers would get the top ranking spots. And they also knew how to um, how shall I say this? I want to be politically correct, but okay, I won't. How to intimidate others. They wanted to intimidate others so other managers wouldn't speak up for their own people and their own team and their own engineers. So knowing all of that, how do you work with that? One thing I learned in this process is that this high-tech company had very strong ethics. And it expected 
their employees, especially their managers and leaders, to have the higher, highest standards of ethics. And because one of the values and the principles of this high tech company was fairness and equality, I knew that even though we had a whole group of people, one that was going to go in and bulldoze things, one that was going to use intimidation, one that was going to be laid back, I knew that as a group, there was some common thread, one, some common theme there that I could probably use in order to make a change in this game. Okay, next slide. So here's, here's a little uh, template that I use, and you can use it for any uh, situation that you want. And I just put, of course, bogus people in here. Uh, but you want to name the player. And then you want to name what that player ca cares about, what's their purpose, and what they worry about, what are their concerns, and some facts about them. Like for Joe Manager, you know, he's known as hardworking, serious, and you know, he, he doesn't have, he's very straightforward, no niceties, and he loves to win. So here's, here's a strong competitor, the one that will maybe go in and bulldoze things. So you want to lay this out so you can look at the whole group of people that you'll be working with, and you'll know how to work with them and how to more or less address them. Because what we want to do is in creating change, in having change, we do want people to support the change. And if you know and understand and care about their purposes and their concerns, they will work with you. Their, their resistance will be reduced. They will work with you. Okay, next. Okay, so build mastery and win the game. Gain practice and mastering the strategies and applying the strategies. That's what we want to do here. Winning doesn't have to mean that you're winning the stated objective of the game. Winning means you define what you want to get out of it. So it could be winning on your terms what you set out to do. Because consciously or unconsciously, every person in the game defines what winning me means to them. For one person, it could be, if I get at least one engineer ranked at the top, then I'll be doing good. Winning for you can mean winning your objective or gaining your outcome for the purpose of making change to happen but you want to be able to define what that is for you. Because then once you master the game, you can win on your own terms. You won't let the game change you. You will be changing the game. Okay, next slide. Here are some qualities, characteristics, skills that you'll need to develop to be a master game changer. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to touch upon them very briefly. Presence meaning being in the moment, being very focused, being able to respond in the moment. Emotional presence. You want to practice this. Don't get upset. Respond rather than react. Intuition. You want to be able to feel into the situation. Every situation has an energy to it. You can walk into a room and feel the vibe of the room. That's what we're talking about. What is it that you, you feel about this? And trust yourself to know that what you were feeling, what your first hit is, is probably very accurate. And having intuition, meaning that you'll be able to walk into a room, get the pulse of the room, and be able to assess the situation very accurately for yourself. Okay, next. Once again, trust yourself. Trust yourself to know that the more you practice, the less inner conflict you have. Your ability to keep moving forward based upon your intuition, trusting yourself is going to be the right direction. An internal fortitude is, is having courage, having internal strength in the face of Anything else going on in the face of defeat, in the face of fear, being mentally tough. 
and knowledge of self. We covered that in strategy number two. That kind of is a placeholder for it. Okay, next slide. Now the outer game is strategy. And when I look at these six strategies, there's an overarching strategy that ties them all together. And the overarching strategy of this is how to win at the change game, how to play that game to win. And so the six strategies fit under that. And a well-formed strategy is key to any game. It's just like in chess, if you're sitting down there in front of a chessboard, you want to be able to assess the situation, assess the other player, look at the moves and determine three, four moves ahead of that, where it's going, going to go. So a strategy, according to Robert Bergelman of Stanford University Business School, is that it's a fluid intention. But that fluid intention is based upon commitment, based upon applying resources, and based upon having a direction. And the grand strategy is the art of looking way beyond the present situation and calculating ahead. You have to focus on the ultimate goal. You have to focus and then plot to reach it. And it doesn't mean that some of the other details won't change in the meantime, but having your focus on your overarching strategy of what you want to win, of what the cause is, of the positive change you want as an outcome is going to keep you focused and keep you on track even if you have to make shifts and changes and maneuver through that, that will keep you focused and moving forward. Okay, next slide. So here's just a little process to use when you're creating your strategies, setting the goal or outcome, it's very basic. Uh, create the scenarios and triggers. I just wanna talk a minute about uh, creating scenarios and triggers. What that means is, uh, there's a process called scenario planning. So whenever you set out for any goal or any outcome, you want to create scenarios that would be, that could occur. Uh, for example, you want to create the very best dream state scenario, the middle of the road, what's the most likely to happen middle of the road scenario, and then the nightmare scenario. What could go wrong will go wrong, but I'm going to be ready for it. In creating these scenarios, you, you would set up little triggers to know what direction your scenario is going to. Is it in a positive track? You're getting lots of opportunities. You're moving forward. So then it's full steam ahead. Are there some obstacles or things you need to understand? There's a little trigger that, that it may go off track. Then you want to pull back and look at it and analyze that. So scenario planning is really setting up the little triggers and the little indicators along the way to help you know where you are in that game and if you're moving forward as you intend. And then develop your course of action based upon that. And always, 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 it's about flexibility. There'll be new players entering into the game and you want to be able to make adjustments as you go along. Okay, next. So in formulating a grand strategy, it really is a process. I'm not going to go into this deeply. There's a lot to these questions, but just know it's an overarching strategy. You really need to look at that it encompasses everything that you want out of it, how you're going to get there, what your goal is, and your method. Okay, next. Okay, changing the game. So once you get into the game and you're ready to change it, all right, I'm going to continue that little story of um, the ranking situation. When I was in that game, I thought, do I really want to get good at this game? And how can I get good at this game if I think the game is unfair? So in that scenario, I did whatever I could to have a positive outcome for it. But when I went in to change the game, I thought, how do I change it? How do I get people to understand and to release their biases regarding 
how they do this. So this is where you go back to really knowing and understanding a lot of the people that you're working with, who you're dealing with, who the players are, all of that. There was one thing that I knew about these, my peers. They were former engineers because this company does not hire managers from the outside. They always promote from the inside. So all of these were former engineers. And knowing that they're former engineers, they have a very strong identity to that. They have a very strong um, identity and uh, process logic. They're very logical. They're very data focused. They're very solution oriented. They love tough problems that they can solve and feel really good about it because it's high tech, right? So they want to, uh, they identify with that. And I knew that about them. So when we get into this room and everybody's using subjective language and, and doing their little song and dance about how this person is really, really great and better than that person and all of that, I started asking questions, what they, they found really annoying. But I asked the question, I said, when you say that this person is really good at solving the most complex problems, how do you evaluate that, that those problems that that person solves are the most complex? Silence. Then I asked another question. I said, well, you know, how do you know that this, pro this person solves the most problems or has the highest customer satisfaction rating or can solve any problem in the book in the least amount of time. So I got very logical with them and very data focused with them. They didn't answer the questions, they couldn't. So I said, well, what if every engineer that solves a problem for a customer logs that problem in a database? And in that database, they rate the complexity of the problem. It's a, if it's a brand new problem, there's usually a level of complexity going on with that problem because it's a first new problem. So they have a way of gauging how complex that problem is, how long it took to solve, what the customer satisfaction rating is, did the customer accept the solution or were they dissatisfied with the solution? All of that is in that database on the problems in addition to how many problems do they solve per day? Yes, I got that exact. So I asked, well, wouldn't it be more fair using that fair and equal, fairness and equality? Wouldn't it be more fair to then pull this data and have this data as input to their performance evaluation? And I got a few responses as to, well, maybe why that wouldn't work, but for the most part, everybody had to acknowledge that one, it would be more fair, two, it would be data oriented, and it would probably be fairly accurate that some of the suggest subjective comments of people saying this person's performing better than that person. So we use that data. We pulled all the data. And guess what? The data showed that over 50% of the most complex problems that were in that database were solved by women. Those problems took slightly longer to solve for a female engineer than a male engineer only because they spent a little bit more time with the customer which then increased their customer satisfaction rating very high. So if we looked at the complexity and we looked at the time spent on a problem, we looked at customer satisfaction and the only other element was how many problems do they solve? As far as the number of problems solved was fairly equal. So then the data did show that these female engineers had the ability, capability, to solve the problems in the same, uh, at the same rate, at the same manner, at the same level of complexity. So now it made it a level playing field. Now we could talk about that and we could talk about other qualities on top of that that would then make them 
high performers. So that was how we got the game changed in, in very small ways. It wasn't small as far as the outcome, but there were minor changes by having data as input as one, one of the elements that we would look at in doing the performance evaluations. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in, in the game, I just wanna make a little comment about this because whenever you change the game, you'll see the early movers, you'll see the optimizers, those that will say, yeah, let's do it and let's go for it and this is great. And then you'll see the disruptors and then you'll see the naysayers. So you'll run all of that gamut. So just be aware of it. And um, the early movers and the optimizers, that's where you want to maximize your ability to change and get people to support that change. Okay, so considerations for changing the game. Um, if there's a better way, and if that better way does not infringe on anyone, will people accept it? Well, sometimes they will, and sometimes they won't. Because better to them is not, or better to you is not necessarily better for them. So you'll have to still understand if they accept it or if they don't accept it. What can we do to understand if they will accept it or not and work with them? Because when you understand more of the acceptance part of the game change, then you will be able to address it at a personal level. The next bullet point here is the lifespan of most new ideas, and I'm going to say in companies, is about 30 seconds, 13 seconds. And do you know why? Well, because it's usually within 10 to 13 seconds, it's shot down by someone saying, nope, it won't work. It's never worked before. We tried that before. Nope, it's not a good idea. Boom. And then that, that idea dies on the table. So you have to be aware that that will happen. You will have to say ideas in a language that people will accept. You have to be able to ask them about their ideas and build on that. You'll have to be able to work with people. Once again, this is personal work with one-on-one -on -one work and sometimes with a group, but it's really understanding all of the players that you're dealing with because it's that important for people to accept the change. Because if not, if people don't accept the change that you're proposing, they will find some way consciously or subconsciously to sabotage it. They will. So you want to get more people to support. You want to collaborate with them. You want to build on what they care about and what they worry about. Because we're all human, we have all of those concerns, but we can work together as a team. And it's about building a team for change and for positive movement forward. So when we look for you know, creative ideas, I just wanted to go back to the last item there. Uh, when we uh, creative look, look for ideas, that intersect, I'm gonna use this term intersection. We want to always intersect with what people care about and what they worry about, what their ideas are and what our ideas are and find that sweet spot, that intersection of where that all comes together and build on that. That is the common ground. Always look for alignment, always look for collaboration, always look for moving it forward with everyone's best interest in mind. Okay, next. Okay, so here, here are some little ways. These are just ideas of how you can change the game. Introduce new rules and talking about how these new rules will uh, solve some of the issues. So what I introduced in, in that situation of the performance evaluations was I introduced a new rule of always having data, the solid data as input to that performance evaluation discussion. And use their rules. If you always want to use the rules that are already set up, then maybe a better version or maybe remove the vagueness from those rules. Have more clarity, have a higher level of definition so that everyone understands that rule the same way rather than their own interpretation of the rule. 
And another way to make a change is to make it a natural evolution of what's already there. But you want to change the outcome. So that means that it has to be a natural evolution of what's already there, but it changes, the little subtle changes will then change the outcome into the positive uh, outcome that you want. You can also look at what all the rules are and all the ones that are ineffective or unnecessary or unfair, move to eliminate them, get rid of them. You don't need them anymore. Anyone that, any rule that's wasteful or wastes time or is highly bureaucratic, you wanna look at that and say, do we really need this? Why do we need this? Let's get rid of it. Let's make this more streamlined. Let's make this better because rules, morph over time, they mutate over time, and sometimes they shouldn't even be there at all anymore. They've outlived their usefulness. Also, when you make a change, make it attractive so that people will want it. And that's where you go back to their purposes, what they care about. So you want to include people's cares and purposes when you want to make a change that would be attractive to the larger group. And in changing, I'm looking at number six now, eliminating resistance. So by identifying the aspects of the status quo, what things are going on, which are ineffective, obsolete, or too rich, rigid, or wasteful, or all of that, you want to get people to agree with you that these are their same observations. So you'll eliminate resistance because they'll say, yes, I agree. That's very ineffective. Let's not do this before, anymore. So you want to be able to get them to not convince them, but get them to see that what is going on doesn't need to be that way. Okay, number seven, pull in your relationships that matter to support the change. And before we talked about, you know, the early movers or the early motivators and the, the people that want to jump on the bandwagon and say, yeah, this is great. Let's go. You want to build that as your team to support the change because it's going to be really, really important. As, as you move changes, people will always want to go back to their comfort zone and how they did things before. That's a natural behavior for people to do. So you want to have supportive ways of reminding people, say, oh, remember, we decided to do this instead of this. Okay, great. Yeah, let's do that. And always when you're changing the game, be innovative. Be positive, be forward thinking, be looking forward. Paint that picture of what it's going to look like and what it's going to be like if these changes are made. Get them to step into that new reality in order to help make that change stick. Now, people can change for a few days, a few hours, but you want to be able to make that change stick by reinforcing it in different ways. Okay. Okay, number six, create your own new game. If this game that you've changed is still not optimizing what needs to happen. It's still not getting the great outcome you are passionate about. Then create a new game. Because you've built your experience and your mastery in changing the game, in understanding the game, you can create a new game that will make the old game obsolete. And that's part of making the old game obsolete and creating a new game that's so attractive, people will say, yeah, let's go that way. Okay, next slide. So, you know, the world is tired of old games and many of the old games are very obsolete these days. We saw that in COVID. We saw that a lot of brick and mortar businesses could not operate anymore, but those businesses that also had a physical presence and an online presence were still surviving or moving forward. So we need to look at, at this as, are these old games still effective? And if not, let's get rid of them and replace them. You want to vision big. The field of infinite possibilities is open for new games. The world is wanting new games. And anything that you're passionate about, Anything that you see that needs to change for the positive, 
and you are feeling an emotion about it, guess what? It's you. You're the one that's supposed to do it because you have those feelings about it, because you can see it. You can see the need for change. You can see, you can feel that passion about changing it. It's you. So what are you going to do to create your own new game? What? <laughs> and if not now, when? That's the question I always like to ask. If not now, when? Okay, next slide. And here are some examples of creating a new game. So Apple's iPhone made all other phones obsolete. Now we know that. And I'm going to tell you a little, a little story is that when um, Apple wanted to produce their phone, they came to Hewlett Packard and asked them if they wanted to take this phone on. You know, they could do um, what they call a, a private label, meaning it would be an Apple iPhone and they would put the HP label on it and HP said, I don't think so. <laughs> nope. And so guess what? Apple computer, they did their own iPhone. They did all of that on their own. Okay. So here's the other thing for, for especially our economy here in Hawaii is that um, online businesses are leveling the playing field of the brick and mortar costs. So any business that's basically in brick and mortar, in order to achieve some level of success in this economy or moving forward or making change, they will have to have some online presence. It, it, it is almost demanding that now these days because everyone's connected to a phone, to a computer, to a tablet, to something. So just consider that if you're a business owner and you're looking at changing that, Change your game because the game is changing around you. And then some other things about creating a new game, fairness, any, you know, fairness and equality versus discrimination. That's a game changer. And this one near and dear to my heart because of the animal control contract is the kill rates versus live release rates. So there were kill rates in the former contract. There's live release rates. How many animals are we saving? How many animals are we releasing? Um, scarcity versus abundance, health and wellness versus illness and disease, Pono versus Pilikia. These are all game changers, even if it is just for you personally. Okay, next slide. I think this is the last one. It's a question for you. What is the new game you'll create? And the next one, next slide, is create a new game. Well, my new game is more women in leadership positions. I really believe when there's more of a balance of men and women in leadership positions, in guiding the businesses and the economy and the nation, we will have a better outcome in our society, in our economy, and in our lives. That's it. Thank you. I'm stopping sharing. We have time for a couple questions. And please, um, I'm going to put the survey for our um, for your feedback. I will put that in the chat box. So if you can do that before you leave, that would be really appreciated. You can just click in on the link there. And if anyone has any questions, um, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Tim, I see you've raised your hand. What would you like to ask? Mahalo, Sylvia. I'm curious, um, do you have any stats on the changes um, that happened at um, Hewlett Packard as a result uh, of, of some of your challenges? Yes, I do. And I would have to dig for them, <laughs> but I, I'm a pack rat, I admit it. I keep everything. I'm sure I'll find it somewhere. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you can put your hand up or you can put a note in the chat. Okay, wait, I see something coming in. How does a mediator employ your change strategy? So how does someone dealing with conflict resolution employ some of these strategies? Okay, well, if, if we look at the strategy, um, let's just say number two, know the players in the game. I believe that was number two, maybe that's number three you really want to know people and understand people and and having um some of the skills that you'll be building on the inner game 
releasing your own internal inner conflict makes you then a clear open channel to understand people better and from that perspective i think as a mediator in the questions that you ask and this the container that you create for them you'll be able to bring some of those skills um, into that into that situation Okay, and someone's making a comment in the chat saying one good example of more women in leadership is that now that there are 28 black women law school deans, including in Hawaii. Right, yes. So a lot of progress, a lot of great movement and we need more. We need more, absolutely. Well, I wanna thank you, uh, Sylvia, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we, if we have your email, we'll, we will be sending you out the slides and a link to the video. Thank you folks all for coming today. We appreciate it. Again, I put the link to our survey in the chat if you don't mind to fill that out. It helps us with our grant funding for, so we can continue our free series. And check out your emails in the coming weeks. We will be sending those slides and videos. So mahalo and hope to see you next month. And the talk is Jelani Madaraka on race, racism, conflicts, and resolutions. So we hope you'll join us for that. Have a great afternoon.